Anderson grass-fed dairy um, what we're aspiring to, uh, I would say. Uh, this is still a, a new model, and, and um, there are still relatively few people trying to figure this out. Um, and at our place and some of the, and the farmers that we work with, with Maple Hill Creamery Milkshed, um, we're still learning a lot and experimenting a lot and figuring out a lot through trial and error every, every year. So um, I don't have a tremendous number of slides. What I would, what I would really like to try to convey is, um, or to try to point out and highlight are the differences or the exceptionalities of, in, on the one hand, grass-fed production, so production without um, starchy grain inputs, so all forage production, and two, dairy production. So there's sort of two um, exceptionalities there that are different than you have grass-fed beef production versus grass-fed dairy production, and you have um, dairy production with the inputs that have been sort of common to date for the last 100 years and forage only production. Um, so I'll just start out with dairy, dairy cow basics. So relative to native cattle or beef cattle, um, dairy cows have very high energy requirements. They have high metabolic needs. So their needs for those macro uh, minerals are very high, especially calcium, magnesium, potassium, phosphorus. Um, they require frequent access to water. So there are many range grass-fed beef producers that are able to impact their land in a regenerative grazing um, method. And they're able to train the herds to having either daily or sometimes every other day or even three day access to water. And they, they do acclimate to um, not having constant access to water. There are people who are pushing the envelope a little bit with dairy cows, but generally, if you want to remain profitable, they need to have water all the time. So that's kind of a logistical issue with having 100% grass-fed dairy production. Um, the, their dry matter intake must exceed their maintenance requirements. Now, I know that's not really an exception if you're going to try to finish beef or, um, you know, that's, that's really true of any cattle that you're trying to get a level of production out of, but um, dairy cows, um, there, there is a significant dry matter increase over maintenance that is required in order to produce a, a financially viable amount of milk for sale. And downturns in health can happen really quickly with dairy cows. Our selected dairy genetics um, are made to sort of run on um, in high gear, I, I guess you could say. And so when we, um, they function the best. We know how they function the best. Dairy cows function very, very well in a controlled environment and with a controlled ration. When we move away from that, they are subject to our management. And our experience with raising beef cows is when pastures started to become a little poor or we decided we wanted to push a little bit to try to make, maybe make some changes on the land or we judge whatever, you know, you had a little bit of a buffer. You could kind of get those girls to work for you pretty well. But if you have some sort of misjudgment in your management with dairy cows, you can literally come back, you know, from morning to night or from night to the next morning and see that these girls are struggling. There's a visible, uh, stress reaction that happens very, very quickly that might happen in a matter of a half a day or a day in a dairy cow might take two or three days or a week to, to happen in a beef cow. Um, so the challenges for the grass-fed dairy production are meeting those needs on a forage-only diet, obviously, um, and creating high-energy forages. Achieving the high mineralization, so that high metabolic need and the high mineral needs of the cow, you can do so much with um, free choice minerals, you really need to meet those requirements in your forages, <clears throat> as well as the cows. Promoting diversity in forages is another challenge. We're used to having access to sort of um, crop stands, so we have 
Um, you know, we have our hay stand, we have our alfalfa, we have our corn, we have our this grain, that grain. That's really what's available to us. And bringing that biodiversity back is really a challenge. And obtaining cows that thrive and contribute positively to your system. So you need to get your hands on cows that'll work. You need to, you need to either breed them or buy them. And they need to obviously thrive, but they also need to contribute to a positive feedback loop, loop, especially with your pasture system. And managing the variability, variability that's inherent to the model. So the cows are outside, they're eating something different every day, the weather is changing. All of those things are stressful on the cow, and a dairy cow, as I mentioned, is built to produce in very strict conditions. So those are the challenges. One of the things that we've seen um, when you don't meet all of those challenges is that a after 18 to 24 months of saying, all right, we're going to transition to all forage, 100% grass-fed dairy production, is it takes about that long for them to get through whatever reserves they had in their system and as a herd. And things go really great for a while, but keep your eyes out because 18 to 24 months later, any shortcomings that you had in those challenges are going to start to pop up. And you say, what's going on? What, what am I doing wrong now? What changed? Well, it was that long ago that you changed um, your production, your management of this herd, and you start to see low fertility and conception rates, some illness, metabolic disorders, and um, production loss. And you'll see, uh, sorry, I should have muted this. Um, you'll see also a decline in pasture productivity um, if you don't keep up with your management of, of that grazing. So these are the general strategies that we'll go over and hopefully we'll um, spur some questions about these. So the first place that you start if you're gonna transition or begin grass-fed dairy production is supplementation. So, um, most of us don't have beautiful, lush, very dense, highly mineralized pastures in winter feed for the cows. So because of their high mineral needs, you need to supplement at some level. Extending the grazing season is another strategy. Bringing food to cows is always a challenge. And grain is light and small and easy to bring to cows. Forage is big and heavy, expensive to ship. You don't want to bring a lot of that to your cows. You want them to go and get it as much as possible. So it's really critical in 100% grass-fed dairy production to be able to extend that grazing season. Uh, creating a complete ration for your pasture in your pastures, also really important, very helpful in meeting those challenges. And acquiring and maintaining those cows that will do well in your system. Boosting dry matter intake, that's getting them to get past their, their needs and increasing the tonnage, mineralization, and energy in the forest forages, and then harvesting growing season forages for the winter. So you need to try to replicate what they're eating in the spring and summer and bring that to them in the winter. So those are what we're gonna sort of go over. Supplementation, so this I just learned last night. Well, Paul did, and he, that this actually should be four ounces per cow per day per Will's recommendation, Will Winter's recommendation. Um, but free choice minerals is a great thing to have with your cows until they stop eating them. So um, just put out as much as you can and have it available as much as you can, and that will help um, subvert, is that the right word, those train wrecks 18 to 24 months later. Um, get them their minerals right away. One of the things that's um, that you get when you buy a grain ration for cattle, they put in minerals. They balance everything out. They, there's nutritionists that work very hard to make sure that those cows are getting everything that they need. And there are mineral supplementations in those grain rations. Um, so when you drop the grain, you're also dropping you know, their daily vitamins and minerals. And you need to replace that. Sometimes it means training them to, to eat those minerals. So um, they're not as palatable when they're by themselves. but Cows will always eat salt, so sometimes you can mix them in with their salt. We offer them out in tubs uh, outside the barn so that when they come in and when they go out, they have a chance to um, get at their minerals. Their mineral needs now at our place are very low. We don't see a lot of mineral uptake. 
We also, in our tie stall, we'll just put minerals out. You know, we don't have grain out there. Sometimes it's hay and sometimes it's minerals and sometimes it's salt. That way we can make sure that everybody is eating their minerals and we can see if there's somebody who obviously is not getting a chance to um, get over to the other free choice minerals, either because they're being bullied or they're just a shy cow or who knows, they're cows. Um, and so you put minerals out for everybody and you have two or three cows that really go at it that now they finally have an opportunity to like have at it unmolested. So um, try to be aware. You, want, you really want to make sure that you're getting minerals into those cows and you might need to be creative in figuring out how to make sure that's happening. Um, so the macros, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, calcium, and also traces, copper, iodine, and selenium, really, really important. Um, especially I'd, the, the copper and iodine for um, just, this is just general cow health um, for pink eye, uh, foot problems. Those are super, super important. Um, and selenium, very, very important for overall health, but especially for reproduction. And then A, D, and E, just like people, those are critical for making sure the, of the bioavailability of those macros. So especially in the wintertime, um, vitamins degrade over time. So you might have highly, um, you might have forages that were harvested, very timely, beautiful forages, and they had A, D, and I guess E. Well, e, D is not in forages, but A and E in the forages. Um, and they're not there by the time March rolls around because they degrade over time. So everything's been bailed up and now they've completely degraded. So you get to be March. Now, if you're seasonal, we'll get into that. You know, you have these um, mineral, these vitamin depleted feeds, some cows in third lactation or third, third trimester of ge gestation, and you're gonna start a cascade of compromises for that cow. So make sure she's got vitamins. Um, apple cider vinegar is a great boost. It feeds directly the rumen bugs for the cellulose, the breakdown of cellulose, and you can feed four ounces per cow per day. Molasses, we don't feed apple cider vinegar or molasses at our farm, but there are many farmers that do. And this is, as I said, most of the supplementation that you do directly to the cow is really important to do when they're making that transition, when they're trying to move from you know, being existing in, under one diet and moving to the next, or when you're trying to build the energy in your, in your pastures and you haven't gotten there yet. Um, molasses is high in B vitamins. It's got a lot of other really nice, um, it's, it's a sugar, but um, I don't even think the, the majority of producers even feed molasses. Some of them are sort of hooked on it. You do want to make sure you don't go over this three pounds per day. You can start to have counter, you, you can start to have negative effects. I don't remember specifically what they were, but I did read about them. So you can actually start to do more harm than good with more molasses than that. You want to keep it pretty low. And make sure they have trace mineral salts. Trace mineral salts are not sources of minerals. There's way too much sodium in trace mineral salts for them to ever achieve the amounts of those other minerals. Um, they can't, they just can't eat enough of whatever other trace mineral they might need because the, the sodium is in the way. It's just too much. Oh. You know, I was going to do that. So extending the grazing season, you want to have grass, obviously, um, well into the fall for as many days as you can. I think, um, or you'll probably cover some of the standards. Tim, maybe? Will you be covering, yeah. co talking about some of the standards yeah. and the way that plays into how, um, but uh, the grass-fed standards should and will, should be and will require more days on pasture for the cows than organic standards currently um, allow for. So was, how many, I see several faces of people that were here, were at my farm for the farm tour. Um, okay, I, I grabbed, um, all the stuff that I had on the side of the barn too for those of you that couldn't make it. So I put my grazing plans and some before and after pictures up on the side of the barn. By far the, the most effective way of extending the grazing season is with, with a holistic grazing plan, hands down, um, or something derived very closely to it. Um, a holistic grazing plan 
has, calculates for you previous carrying capacity, dry matter intake, and um, recovery periods, but it doesn't really calculate recovery periods. Recovery periods happen as a function of length of stay. So what you're really, wh when you're grazing, you want to manage your recovery periods, but really what you're managing is how long you're staying in this area. So for us, you can see there's, uh, you know, there's brake wire here. Here's a, the permanent either stream bed or perimeter. We'll have, through the year, we'll have one long brake wire. And then when we need to move through this pasture in a day, we'll just divide it in half. And they'll go there in the morning, and they'll go there at night. When I need to move through here very quickly, when it gets later into the season and things slow down, I'll put a brake wire here, and then another brake wire here, and another brake wire here. And they'll get this for one night, one day, one night, next day. And so I break up the paddocks, you know, sort of in, I have a big chunk, and then I break them into sort of a little bit smaller chunks. And then throughout the season, we break up with smaller wires, and those are the ones that move. Um, and that's really, really critical. And that's the way you can govern how fast or slow you come around in, in a pasture. Um, so I highly recommend going to, you can read the book, but for me, I needed to go and actually do a seminar, do a class, do a one-day workshop, because it's really difficult to muddle through those calculations on your own. Um, so creating a complete ration, we, um, I remember thinking, I remember, I, we, we live very close to State University in New York at Cobleskill, and um, the relationship that we have with, with the university is growing and, and um, becoming very, very nice and, and collaborative. When we first moved into the area, there were few organic farms and there was a, um, almost a disdain for organic production. And I thought, well, that's really awful. I mean, you know, I, we should all, you know, produce the way we, we see fit. But I, I didn't really understand how, um, I remember the first time that somebody said, well, that's just cruel. Organic dairy production is just cruel. And I thought, well, no, it's the opposite of cruel. What are you talking about? You know, I mean, you always think that you're doing the best that you can. You know, and their view is that you're neglecting the cows. Well, they don't treat anything, and they don't fertilize anything. What kind of farmers are those? And I went, oh, my goodness. I had no idea. I mean, obviously, that's not true, but that was the impression. So. Um, when we started producing milk on forage only, it was even more exaggerated. They thought, well, that's great. Now it's organic and grass-fed. So now you don't treat them, you don't fertilize anything, and you don't give them any energy source. Well, isn't that great? I mean, you should be thrown in jail, is really the way some people were reacting to this. And rightly so, if that were actually what was happening. If you have a ration for your cow herd and it consists of some corn silage, some small grains, um, and uh, dry hay, which is an alfalfa, and then a little bit of dry hay, which is mostly maybe Timothy and brome grass, and that's what you're putting in the mixer and, or putting out for your cows, and you take away the corn silage and the grain, and you're left with alfalfa and Timothy and brome grass dry hay, well, yeah, that's not going to cut it at all. And, and you will lose some cows. You'll run into some problems. So we need to think about how, when we created the ration that we have for cows that includes the grain, the corn silage, the alfalfa, and the, and the hay, what we're doing is we're, we're creating a, a, a total mixed ration, a complete ration for the cows. But we arrived there through the convenience of mechanization. The reason we, cho we choose those feeds is because of the industry as a whole. So a lot of it has to do with the way those feeds are planted, harvested, and, and handled. So we have grasses, just a few grasses, because those plants dry well. So we have, you know, we have our Timothy and brome grass, and we can turn that very nicely into dry hay. When you start to add heavy legumes and broad leaves and other, you know, what we would all consider weeds, it gets really hard, especially in the Northeast and in some climates, to dry that hay and then to market it. Now you have got variabilities and consistency and well, what am I getting this time? You have people that are selling hay and people that are buying hay and feeding it to cows. So you need all of these consistent marketable 
aspects to your feed, and you have corn, and you have all this, this stuff. But those were brought in to replace what originally existed for cows when they went out into their pastures. They had all different forbs. You know, there's plantain and dandelion and, you know, some older grasses, some newer grasses. All of that was providing a complete ration to the cows. When they brought them in and decided to, to move the, the food to them, they had to come up with all of these things. So now you've taken this diversity and you've turned it into corn, grains, alfalfa, and dry hay. You need to turn this back into a complete ration. That, so you're sort of re-replacing those other inputs. You can't just take out what was there to replace something else, is my point. So in order to provide that complete ration, and you're going to remove these other crops that you can purchase, you have to put it back into both the hay stands and the pastures. So you have to really promote that diversity. The grazing plan that allows you to vary the stays in each pasture throughout the year and move through quickly and slowly will provide a growth curve and a population curve that will foster all of these um, diverse plants growing in succession throughout the year. And that's how you can get your full cow needs. There's a, so the, um, one of the things that one of our farmers brought up was uh, bypass protein. There's no way to get bypass protein in forages. Well, that's not true. Actually, uh, red clover is very high in bypass protein, um, but you don't, you don't generally see a lot of red clover in a lot of pastures because that requires, um, they can be driven out really quickly with uh, short rest periods. Um, and these other secondary metabolites that occur in all of these forbs take up a lot of those other um, nutritional needs that those hired nutritionists in the um, commercial dairies have managed to put together. So acquiring and maintaining efficient grazers, you can graze them. I mean, you can buy them or you can raise them, not graze them, raise them yourself. Um, so young stock, I don't have a lot of slides, but we, you know, Will Winters asked me to coin my calves raised on the mother, and I call it the madre method. So again, in order to, um, you know, when the milk industry started to really grow, they wanted to sell all the milk. The milk brought a, a premium, and the grains that you could buy were inexpensive. So it just made sense, um, oh, I, you know, for, for people to sell the milk and buy the grains, because there was a net profit involved in that. We've sort of, now I would argue that we've sort of pushed that to its limit and grains are so expensive and we're getting so little for the milk, we're really you know, just crippling our own future by selling that milk and then buying an input. You're much better off just feeding the calves the milk. So the, the, the grain to calves was brought in because of that difference in price. So grain, again, was used to replace milk. So when we go to a grain-free production model, what do we need to put back in? We put milk back in. So we raise the calves on milk. We do it directly on their mother um, up through puberty. We want to get a full endocrine development happening before um, we take them off of milk. We want that high plane of nutrition. Um, so that's raising them. Now maintaining efficient grazers. Um, my perspective on seasonal calving, um, and I guess this could apply to goats and sheep as well. All of this information is probably very transferable over. Um, so seasonal production, when you move to 100% and you don't have sort of that ability to, um, to buffer that rapid spring growth um, that you frankly probably are managing for, very high octane grasses, when you don't have that ability, you are um, economizing on winter feed much of the time. So you have third trimester cows on you know, feed that is basically maintenance feed, which is fine, um, especially if you're going to supplement. You're calving in the early spring, and you're, you're using this high octane grass to really push a lactation. And then when uh, the grasses start to slow down, if you're really grazing and focusing on those few spring months, you know, um, the end of April, May, June, and into July, when that's 
summer heat starts to come in, you've got a cow that um, finished up her pregnancy on just maintenance feed, was pushed to the peak of her lactation without a lot of balance of energy, perhaps, in that ration. And now she's being asked to um, come out of that, that lactation and breed back. And um, the convergence of all of that timing ends up culling a lot of high-producing cows because um, you're, really, you're really accentuating a whole bunch of really high needs in her at one time and you can lose some, you, you start to lose body condition and you can lose fertility and you might get cows that will skip a heat or two right when you need them to conceive in a very tight calving window. So um, moving, we, we calve mostly in the fall. The, the reason for doing that began because that's when Maple Hill Creamery needed the milk and they needed people to, to start to do that. And in reality, once we started to do it, um, there was more of an impetus to, to extend that grazing season. So we wanted to make sure we had grass for those fresh cows. And um, these cows had the benefit of being on diverse forages and grass for many months before they had to um, calve, you know, they could finish out their pregnancy, calve and be fresh, still on nice lush green grass and it's really a plus. So maintaining your, your good grazers has a lot to do with timing and time of year, especially of calving. Um, so when you're se selecting cows, generally the cow size we like is about 1,000 or 1,100 pounds. Um, Newman Turner, so we, we don't look at efficiency for you know, feed in and pounds of milk out total pounds of milk, but whoops, we look at um, total solids, which is butter, fat, protein, and other solids, in relation to body weight and food consumed. So how, how many pounds of food do they eat with the solids, and how much do they weigh, and how much um, are they bringing, putting out in those? So when you have an efficient cow, this, this girl, she was a favorite on, <laughs> on Wednesday. She weaned 72% of her body weight in six months. Um, he was already 72% of her body weight at six months, and she, uh, she did actually wean him at nine and a half months and, and calved again in an 11-month calving window. That's, a, that's an efficient cow. Now, if she were, she's about like this tall, so she would never make it in a, you know, the, what we call an efficient dairy these days. But for us, her ability to, for, to graze and turn that into milk or her calf is astounding. So again, early nutrition is really important. We have the calves, all the calves are started on their mother, the ones that we keep, which is generally five to 10 a year, stay and remain with their mother for that length of time. Isn't she pretty? That's Anna. Um, so boosting dry matter intake, uh, intake another challenge in grass-fed production. They don't have that sort of that um, that innate hunger of an imbalanced metabolism or a ration that is designed to be very highly palatable all the time. So some tricks you can use are frequent moves. You can increase your stock density. That often boosts dry matter intake when you tighten those groups up and make those cows crowded a little bit more. But that also um, requires that you move them more often. But every time you move cows, they will eat. So even when it's hot and they don't feel like, mo feel like eating, you can move them and get that. Um, increasing tonnage, again, the plan and the ability to work that plan with a cow, you know, she is going to be pushed more than, um, than she would if she were just standing in a free stall, you know, really being cushy comforted. Um, they, they are required to deal with weather and walking around a lot. So um, in order to increase the tonnage in your pastures, you need a cow that'll do it that'll work your grazing plan, and you need a grazing plan to work. Um, mineralization, so you want to get mineral cycles pumping. Um, this is, I put this up here because this, this is what animal impact looks like. So high stock densities will do more for you in changing the behavior of the cows and, and getting them to, to graze a paddock more evenly and reduce selectivity within the herd. Um, 
because most of the year you won't get that hoof impact that's really required to be um, what I would consider animal impact. So there was a water tub here, and you know this is how much forage was in and around this area before it was grazed or trampled. And so it's this right here that is actually an animal impact. And you know this will have a, a sort of a bump in production next time everything grows back because of that pressing down of the excuse me organic matter into the soil. Um, adding active organic matter. So this is our method. So these, you, those of you that were, this was the paddock actually that the cows were in when you were just here. So I think this must be, I would say this is probably April of this year we took this photo. And those are the bale spots um, that we sort of flagged. And we had a little sign here. And th this area came back in thistle. This area came back in red clover and chicory and plantain and grasses. Um, there was one right over here that just pumped up in some grass that, uh, I, I actually think it was maybe a, a Sudan grass because it was a sorghum Sudan cross that we, bale that we fed there. <laughs> we got one of the parents <laughs> to grow back. Um, this is, then that you we could still see some of the area. These are some wet grasses that this area is pretty, it's a really seepy, wet area of the field that never grew anything very palatable. But now all of these spots are growing completely different plant species than the areas where we did not lay a bell. Oh, you can see the sorghum bell right here too, another one, see that coarse stuff. Um, and energy, you want wide solar panels. This actually is not really a very ideal pasture because it, it's just dominated by one species of grass. You'd really want to get more diversity in there. So um, this pasture, I would graze early in the spring and then shorten the rest period, that would help keep those grasses at bay and open up the canopy for some clovers and things to, to grow in um, early in the spring and establish. And then you can manage that a little bit better with your timing later. But when, once you have sort of a general plan laid out and you know how, you have to, how long you have to stay everywhere else, you can plan very, very easily to come back here. You can plan very easily in the wintertime to start here and then plan very easily to come back here really quickly in the spring. Um, but this is a huge solar panel. Um, so this is one of those pasture stick things. And that, that's 18 inches right there. So this is a really very deep sward of grass. And there's a lot of solar energy being collected right there. That's what you're going for. So that's, this is the planning. You just have to sit down and do it. Um, and that's, that's the way you get those things. Um, harvesting feed. So. Um, I, I don't know as much about this as Paul does, but he, uh, I overheard a conversation he was having uh, that, the, you know, he said the Europeans are 20 years ahead of us on this. You don't, wanna, you don't want to windrow everything when you mow and start that composting action. Um, you want, when you mow, you want to swath everything right out mow it when it's at its high sugar, which is in, in this region, I think, in the afternoon, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You want to go out, mow it down, and swath it out. Let it lay overnight. And then late the next morning, rake everything up, bale it, and wrap it up. And that's, that's a way to get really high quality baleage um, for, for winter feed. Um, and obviously, hay is, that's been made the same way for forever. Um, you don't want to go to an all uh, haylage ration. You need to have some stems for that rumen to function. So you've got to have some baleage or dry hay in that ration for the cows. Um, really uh, extremes in feed, you know, some nice coarse first cut long stem hay and rocket fuel you know, alfalfa baleage, I'll put that out for them and they'll do fine because they have everything they need. They won't, they'll, they'll, they'll milk themselves to death just eating the, the alfalfa. Um, you can, if you have something that's a little heavy, a little hot in protein for them, um, for us in the tie stall, when we bring them in, either if they're eating bales out in the field and they've sort of you know, slowed down eating or they've been grazing and they're, they're done grazing for a little while, 
we bring them in and have dry hay available for, for them first while they're hungry. I mean, everybody knows that trick. You can do that a little bit, but more so you need to already have the diversity in the stand. And that's really the best way to keep a full ration. So even your hay and baleage ground, you wanna have a, a diverse mix of broad leaves, narrow leaves, different grasses, different legumes, as many as you can get in your, in your hay stands. Um, we do need to renovate our hay land because we, can't, we don't get cows. The best thing to do is to take one cut of hay off of your pastures once you get the mineral cycle working. You don't wanna harvest manure into your hay, obviously. So um, once you get the pastures working, that manure will break down really quickly and you could take hay off of it. Um, so this is, this is when, you know, it's like family time is picking rocks, you know, that's like, <laughs> I don't know. You gotta work, you gotta, you gotta try to avoid too much of that. Um, but um, generally in, uh, in our spent ground, which is what, as I said, most of us have, um, we do two years of annuals and cover crops and then put it into a diverse um, hay mixture. Um, and it really takes two years to get that um, soil conditioning. Uh, sorghum is an excellent soil conditioner. Once you cut it once, it tillers and it's, it really adds some nice um, structure to the soil. And then we either plant buckwheat with the sorghum or, or even um, we've done it after if we cut it early, but with the sorghum works really well. And then ryegrass um, or millet I think you can do millet in the fall, can't you? Can you tell I'm like the grazer person and not the, <laughs> not the bead making person? Um, and we have actually begun to grow um, corn. Corn also can be a nice soil conditioner. So we'll, if it's sod, we'll, um, we'll do a year of corn and then, or two or a year of corn and then uh, sorghum and buckwheat. Buckwheat for us is nice because phosphorus is our limiting factor, so buckwheat helps to scavenge some of that. And we don't harvest the buckwheat, we just put it back in. The same with the rye, we just roll it or disc it back in. Um, and that's it for the strategies. And then I put this one, not, be, not only because the younger three kids are so adorable in this picture, um, but this is the, um, dirt that just, it's, this is, where we have, we are growing our garlic and we have our garden, but we, um, we fed the horses round bales out in the winter for three winters in a row and when that stuff started to break down, it was like we have this like little patch of peat moss. It's absolutely beautiful. But um, adding that organic matter and getting the roots functioning, it's, you know, it's unbelievable. I, I, um, I always think that if we had, if we did have a time machine and we went back 75, 80, 90 years and we brought someone, they would, they would be absolutely white and struck with the desertification that is even happening here in this environment. Because when I look at the potential of that solar panel and I, and I look at the, the plant density and the, the size and expression of the plants and the leaf width of what can happen on unstolen from soil, I just, I can only imagine what they were seeing on a regular basis and how just, because it's a slippery slope and it happens so slowly, so slowly it's the frog in the, in the water that, you know, we really need to, and I guess that's why we're all here. <laughs>